Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Outliers YouTube channel and our program, Get to Know. I'm your host, D.P. Lyle, and I'm here with my cohort in crime, Kathleen Antrim. Thanks, Doug. It's great to be here. And today we've got another fantastic interview for you. Um, a very interesting topic, I might add. He is a number one international bestselling author. He's a New York Times bestselling author. His work has been published in over two dozen languages. He has um, sold millions of copies of his book, and his name is Linwood Barkley. Welcome, Linwood, to Get to Know. It's great to have you here. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's so much fun to uh, get to delve into your background a little bit. And if you've watched any of our uh, interviews, you'll, you'll know that my first question is always about your childhood. Oh. Feel free to spread out on the couch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I um, would like to know if you think that your childhood, where you grew up, how you grew up, et cetera, contributed to you becoming a writer. Were you an introverted child, extroverted? Do you have imaginary friends? Do you share? <laughs> well, I think there's two aspects to that. Um, uh, the sort of, <clears throat> and I would mark sort of the age of 16 as a kind of dividing point. But before that, um, I was a, I, a kid in the 60s who was addicted to television. And, and what, you know, I would love to be able to tell people that what got me interested in writing was, you know, reading Hemingway and Mark Twain and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. And it, and for me, it was television. So I had, as you know, like at the age of 10, 11, 12 years old, I had shows that were I loved so much that one episode a week wasn't enough for me. I had to have more. So I would write more stories uh, using characters created by someone else, what we would call fan fiction today. Wow, that's and very I, interesting. And so at, when I was probably... 11 maybe i started writing um novellas based on the man from uncle and then mission mm -hmm. impossible and you know manix and stuff like that and and i think when i was in sixth grade or so i asked my dad to teach me how to type so i could crank these things out faster and he gave me this five minute lesson he said your fingers sit here this finger hits that key this finger hits that key there where you go and all the bad habits I learned when I was 11, I still have. I still can't do the number key without looking, you know, the row. I just can't do it. And and so by the time I was, you know, in grade seven or eight, I was writing 30, 40 page novellas or longer based on the shows that I loved. And so, and, you know, and I wasn't, we weren't a, a family that was sort of devoted to sports. You know, my dad watched golf on TV on Sundays. That's about as athletic as we were. So I wasn't spending time going to soccer practice or hockey, living in Canada, it wasn't hockey practice. So I just wrote like crazy. And then the other thing I think that shaped who I am and so forth was, my dad was a, a commercial artist. He was, um, he wrote, he, he was a commercial illustrator. So if you were to look through the pages of Life, Look, Saturday Evening Post in the 50s and early 60s, and all the car ads for illustrations. Well, my dad drew those cars. And, and but as the 60s progressed, photography killed what he did. And so he, so he wasn't really doing what he, is, he was trained to do. And so, in fact, we're just looking at my bookshelf here. There's something I have to show you. I'll be back real soon. Okay. So, <laughs> just <laughs> so, yeah. I actually, I just had shows you. So a couple of years ago, I did a, a sort of a Michael Creighton esque kind of thriller about self driving cars running. Oh. Wild. But on the title page, you have this Cadillac. Yeah. And, uh, my dad drew that car. So oh, that's so cool. Among the collection, and I managed to put it into the book. So. Fantastic. So you came, so, so you grew up in a family where art was a potential career. Yeah, and my, I guess that's true. Um, and and uh, and I certainly wasn't discouraged from writing, you know, even as a just a hobby as a kid. But but because my dad's the career that he had was dying, my parents bought a condo resort trailer park fishing camp, um, about an hour and a half northeast of Toronto, uh, on a lake up that way. And so we were running this this fishing camp, this resort, 
resort sounds like a fancy word for what it was. Um, you know, we had, we rented cabins that didn't have bathrooms or running water. There was a central, you know, men's and ladies room thing. And, but when I was 16, um, <clears throat> my dad, uh, he became, he, he died. My dad became ill. Mm. He was only 59. He died of cancer at, when I was 16 years old. And I was basically thrust into the position of running and managing the camp. I mean, my mom did the paperwork and managed it and so forth. Mm -hmm. Actual work, pretty much I did. I mean, I had an older brother. He was 11 years older, but he was, he had a lot of problems as well. And he was recovering from, he had schizophrenia, he had a lot of problems. So I was basically running it. So, and I think that, that what happened to me at 16 and, and sort of running this camp, which had this sort of revolving door cast of characters of people who came up every year. We had guests from Pennsylvania and Ohio and, and upstate New York and Ontario and so forth. And I was introduced to all these, I was surrounded by character, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of them very sort of funny and very oddball. And, and I still kept writing all through that period, you know, sometimes more stories of with characters of my own, although I did want to write, I was writing Columbo fan fiction. And, and so I think that, that between the, the television addiction and then being thrown into this sort of position of tremendous responsibility at the age of 16. I didn't have this sort of these great wild teenage years where you went out on Saturday night and got completely pissed or whatever because <laughs> I was the I was holding the fort together. Mm -hmm. So but I think somehow that experience also shaped what I ended up doing. If that mm -hmm. makes any sense. I don't know. Have I been on the couch long enough? Does it make no. some sort of... Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you were thrust in, into the position of being kind of the man of the house. Yeah. If we're going to talk about traditional roles, which back then, yeah. roles were pretty traditional. Um, and it's interesting to me that you kept writing even through all of that. So obviously that was a, a passion of yours, a real love to, to write, whether they were your own characters or writing um, fan fiction. Well, when I went, you know, when I got to be 18 or whatever, I went to university and I went to a university that was in driving within driving distance of the camp because up until the Canadian Thanksgiving, which is in October, we were still open. So I was going back and forth from school to keep wow. to be doing the work. And come May, you know, or late uh, April, early May, I had to start getting it ready to open it. And so, but I was still, I think I wrote during my university years, uh, I think I wrote two novels, um, which we can all be grateful that where they were not published. Um, <laughs> you know? But, and the other thing that happened to me when I was in, two other really quickly things that I think were, had an impact on me, was that when I was um, starting around the age of, well, when I went to university first, before there was Margaret Atwood in Canada, there was Margaret Lawrence. Margaret yeah. Lawrence was one of Canada's premier sort of literary writers of fiction um one thing you would in the u.s would at least would know her for might be the paul newman movie starring joanne woodward rachel rachel that's based on a Margaret lawrence novel and margaret was a writer in residence at the university and i went to see her you know you could go and talk to this person who was a published writer and and she would read my stuff and we became very close friends uh, that lasted you know until her until her passing we became very close friends but the other thing that happened too to have another writer of note take interest. When I was in uh, sort of towards my final year at, um, at Trent University, which is where I went, I wanted to write a thesis on the private eye as an iconic figure in literature. And I wanted to talk about Sherlock Holmes and so forth. But what I really wanted to do was zero in to narrow the focus and write about Lou Archer the detective created by Ross McDonald, whose real name is Kenneth Miller. And I started reading those books when I was about 15 or 16. I first one was The Goodbye Look. And I just, I just was completely obsessed with his novels. I loved them so much. So I wrote a letter to, to Elfkinoff Publishing, care of them, to him saying, I'm writing a thesis about you. Um, are there things you could point to me, point me to that may have been written about you that, you know, would help me in doing this so forth? And lo and behold, one day I get a letter from 
uh, Santa Barbara, California. And it's a letter from Kenneth Miller. And he says, there was a Newsweek cover story about me and you might want to check out this and so forth and how nice to hear from you and so forth. And then I did this really horrible thing. I wrote him back and said, I've written a novel. Can I send it to you? <laughs> and he said, sure. Wow. Wow. And so I did. And that began a very long correspondence back and forth. Uh, I'm in Tom Nolan's Scribner biography on Ross McDonald because he had all of my letters to him were archived. And it all culminated when he was coming to Peterborough, where the university was located, with his wife, the noted mystery writer Margaret Miller, who had relatives there. And he, I get a call that, hey, we're going to be in Peterborough. Would you like to have dinner with me? Wow. And that would be like for any other kid in Canada, getting a call from Bobby Orr, you know, do you want to hang out? <laughs> uh, so I cared, I couldn't care less about hockey. And so I spent a whole evening with him. And, and it would be years later before I had a first novel come out. But I think that the fact that someone like him took an interest mm -hmm. told me that maybe I, one of these days, I could do this. And he yeah. wrote uh, my most treasured book on the shelf over there, not far from where this one was, is a hardback edition of, of Ross McDonald's novel, Sleeping Beauty, in which he writes in the front for Linwood Barclay, who will, I hope, someday outwrite him. Oh wow. my gosh, that's so cool. Signed wow. Racket, Ross McDonald, May 1st, 1976. Wow. Well, that's, so, that's, that's an amazing story. Yes, so you're, you're writing, your stories are, are, are thrillers, obviously, and they end up being very thrilling, but they're a lot about family dynamics, mm. uh, great characters, uh, common people put in uncommon situations and things like that. And, and I want to point out for our listeners that there's, there's one book that struck me and I, it's leading to a question I want to ask you as so unbelievable was a tap on the window. Mm. And I, I, people talk about thrillers. They have to be, they have to hook you. They have to have a, a, a rapid start. They have to, this starts with an ominous feeling. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> the main character recognizes that immediately with the first line of, of the first chapter, there's a little prolong before, but, but when the story really starts and it's a middle-aged man, who's going to pick up this underage girl who's standing in the rain to be a good Samaritan. And as a reader in the first three or four sentences of this book, you're screaming, no, 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 no. And then sure enough, the answer is no, because the, the whole story unfolds. So my question is, and I had a feeling because Maybe it's because the way I write. Uh, did you just have that scene in mind and start this story, or did you have the whole story in line and just crafted this scene? Because it felt like this was one of those things you're thinking about and say, this would make a great scene, and then what happens next? That's Well, the, the I can, and of course, I wrote that a while ago, but I can right. think back to that. That book was a tough one only because, not to do with that opening, but the underlying foundation of the story we felt wasn't strong enough. And so I it was like excavating the foundation out of a house and putting another one under it. And I <laughs> so that was a very, that was a major rewrite on the book, but, but the opening, I like, you know, usually for me, books start with a really, like I think of a great hook and I think what's a way to grab somebody. And the hook in that was what if the hitchhiker you picked up was not the same hitchhiker that you dropped off. And when and, and quickly explaining, he picks up this girl and he picks her up because he thinks she's she looks like a friend of his son who has passed, who has died. And he gives her a ride and she says she doesn't feel well. And so he pulls into a fast food place and she runs in and then she comes back out and gets in the car. And he notices that a cut that had been on her hand when she first got in the car is no longer there. And he realizes that the girl in the car with him now is someone different but is posing as the other girl. And so I had that hook mm -hmm. in my head. I thought, that's how I want to open the book. Yeah. And then I have to figure out what in the hell happened. Yeah. And, okay. and, and I want, and before I start writing, I want to know what that was. I don't want to try to figure it out along the way. I need to know. And, and so, uh, but that was how that, that book came together. I mean, it, 
it it reminds me of I did a book a couple of years ago called Take Your Breath Away, in mm. which a woman is supposedly having just gone out, you know, to a grocery store, um, comes back home and pulls into her driveway and looks and says, What's happened to my house? Where's my house? And um and she and and you know it's a different structure sitting on the site than before when she left. And I love this idea so much, but I couldn't figure out really what in the hell happened. So that idea played around in my head for a couple of years before one day I thought I got to figure this out. And then I wrote that book. Yeah. Love it. Wow. Well, I think the take home message here is the hook is a chill, a thrill or something. It doesn't have to be a gunfight or an explosion. What it's got to do is say, uh oh. Right. Yeah, it's got to be something that kind of just grabs you. Yes. And and sometimes it's a question of a, a, a question of sort of trying to turn what's a familiar sort of plot hook and turn it upside down. And there have been lots of probably books where you pick up a hitchhiker and that goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. But I thought, what if we swap out hitchhikers? I thought that's that's taking a familiar premise and then doing something completely different with it. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and so and it worked yeah well and that book, it was that, chilling <laughs> that's that book i think you know i don't think about that book very often because it was a real tough one to put to do yeah but looking back i think it's one of my one of my better books i so, think so <laughs> when did you decide to, to make a career out of writing when i could afford it um <laughs> <laughs> i spent you know, when I when I could say I was writing novels in my early twenties, and at twenty two when I graduated university, I thought, well, you know what? I think I'll just now become a famous best selling novelist. <laughs> and the only problem was that the books were, you know, I could go to the I could go to the mailbox and send a manuscript off to Simon and Schuster, and it would be home before I got there. Like that's how fast they could reject me. And so, <laughs> and so I think it was a Snoopy cartoon like that. But anyway. Um, <laughs> I, but I was writing them and I thought, well, you know, so I thought, where can you get paid money to write every day? And so at the age of 22, I got my first daily newspaper job. And so I worked in newspapers for 30 years and about, and I, the last, you know, 25 of them or more at the Toronto Star, which is the largest circulation paper in Canada. And for the last 15, 14 years, I got a gig as a columnist at the paper, so a so-called, so-called humor column. And I would say sort of allegedly a humor column because if you know you read humor in a newspaper and nobody laughs, I don't know what it is. But <laughs> uh, but out of that grew, I wrote four sort of comic thrillers about a character named Zach Wong, and they got some nice reviews. Uh, Bantam published them. I think collectively they sold about 115 copies, and <laughs> and then I and my agent said, you know, these are good books, but Funny thrillers aren't big sellers, and I think you need to write a quote big book. And so I came up with an idea for a book that became uh, a novel called No Time for Goodbye, which came out in 2007, 2008, and that one went like crazy. And that that was that became the single best selling novel of the whole year in 2008 in the UK. So wow. then I, I think I can give up the newspaper gig because I wasn't going to give up my day job until the writing books would make me more than the day job. So I felt it was a buffer, like a comfortable buffer. So that's, and that happened. So I quit, I quit the Toronto Star. Uh, I quit writing my column around 2008 or six or something like that. And um, I took a year's leave of absence. And then during that year, uh, newspapers as they are inclined to do lately we started offering buyouts like crazy and so during that year I decided that I took a buyout and I didn't come back cool well yeah. speaking of of, of uh, great characters and speaking of uh, common people getting put in uncommon circumstances why don't you tell us a little bit about this all right so <laughs> that is the new one um yep. It came out it's a few weeks ago. It comes out in the UK, I think August 1st. And that is about a teacher named Richard. And uh, Richard, this is a, really a book about uh, how uh, no good deed goes unpunished. 
Uh, Richard is a teacher and there a kid shows up one day at school with uh, with a bomb and Richard manages to avert what could have been a far worse situation. It ends tragically, but it could have been so much worse. And Richard, this draws a lot of attention to him and and some student out of the school's past comes forward and uh, levels an accusation at Richard and says he'll go public with it. We'll let everybody know that you're not the big hero that you appear to be, and I'm going to go public with this. Uh, and he's now in, trapped into a blackmail scheme. And uh, so he and this draws him into an even bigger mess. And it's uh, and and not on top on the top. And if all that weren't enough. Richard is uh, has on the school curric on his curriculum. He's he's an English teacher. He's teaching uh, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, which is not on. The <laughs> but he figures kids that have grown up with The Walking Dead and Twenty Eight Days Later can handle The Road. But one kid gets kind of freaked out by a depiction of cannibalism, which leads to a whole bunch of parents getting together, and wondering what on earth are you teaching, and why is the school encouraging cannibalism? And <laughs> you know. So he's got to come at him from pretty much all sides. And that's, but so, and it's all, it's gotten lovely reviews, you know, uh, this book. And, and uh, I think as an author, as a writer, you guys would know, you just, when you do a book, you get so close to it. You think, I don't know, like, is this, is this good or is it just rubbish? Right. And this was a book that I just thought, I don't know. And, but the reaction to it has been really gratifying. People. That's the that's the thing people I don't think understand about writing novels is that you really don't know because you even if you have readers and even if you have an agent that reads and tells you it's great, you don't really know. And no. you've got to throw it out there and then say, oh, my God, please let it work. I do know and I guarantee you, you do this, too. You get 40,000 words into it and you hate it because it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And this is a stupid story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I become really good friends over, through the last few years with with uh, a writer named Tom Straw, whose new book *The Accidental Joe* is out and it's great. And Joe and and Tom said he was asked one time, "What's it like to be a writer?" You know, like what like this sort of a romantic notion. He said, "It's a constant battle with doubt." Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. And fear. That's yeah, and then that, that sums it up. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of times sitting in a room by yourself and, uh, it really takes away from the rest of life. And you know, you, you got to need this, not just want it. You got to need this. I'd honestly believe that. I know. And, and, you know, if, if I, if I weren't otherwise unemployable, maybe I would do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for you? What are, what are you yeah. heading, heading toward uh, now? I have, I have, I have, this is an interesting question. Actually, I have, uh, written, of what I would call more of a, of a, it's a thriller, but it has sort of supernatural and horror elements. It's a little bit of mm. my lane. And my publisher at first, publishes at first were sure, not really quite sure what to do with it, but it appears now that they've come to their senses and they're going to try to put it out there. Uh, it's a book I want to do for, um, for toy trains, what Chucky did for dolls. It's basically what this book will be like. <laughs> and, and that's and tentatively it's called whistle so that's coming and i also have delivered uh a few weeks ago to my publisher the first draft of the kind of a thriller that you would sort of more in line of what you would expect from me which is about now tell me if you know this phrase because uh, porch pirates yes so, so i live i could turn the computer around i live right downtown toronto mm -hmm. on a you know, busy little neighborhood street and I don't order anything to the door because I know it may be gone in seconds. And you know that there are even people who follow the delivery trucks around the neighborhoods and snatch off. Oh, wow. They had one on the news yesterday. Yeah. The guy so, sets it down and immediately this guy runs by and picks it up and runs away. And the poor delivery guy's standing there like, what just happened? Yeah. It's unbelievable. So I thought, what if you had a couple of uh, misfits, not really villains, but a couple of downer notes? who are porch pirates and one day they take a package that they should, would have been better leaving on the step. Ooh. And so that's the premise for that. Ooh. So I think my that's hope is, is that both of those books will come out next year. Um, 
And so I'm Interesting. Kind of, I'm sort of posting. I'm posting right now. Yeah. I don't really need to start because I'm on a book of your schedule, like you know, so many of us. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really need to start thinking about what I might write next till close to the end of the year. Um and, but you will. You know, well <laughs> And as we, although <laughs> that porch pirate book was my third book in a three book contract, so I'm out of contract. So someone's okay. going to have to send me an email and say we'd like you to do more. Yeah. You know what's really interesting? I, as I as I see, I look out at the street below. We're on a one way street, and I like to see all the cars that go the wrong way. I just saw one go by. So if you're the <laughs> <laughs> one way to keep yourself occupied, right? Very entertaining. <laughs> Well, Linwood, my friend, friend, this has been fantastic. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. It was good to see you. It's been a few years, and hopefully, our paths will cross very soon, and and we can sit yeah. and swap lies. Yeah, we'll have to have you back, you know, very soon because you are a great interview. So, thank you well, so much. This was really a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. This was uh, this was great fun. Good. And I want to ask our viewers to please click the thumbs up and subscribe if you'd like to see more of these interviews. It helps with our algorithms. And we have a lot more coming up um, down the track here. Doug's been scheduling new interviews, and we'll kind of leave it at that. There's going to be a lot of fun interviews We're, coming. We are going to have Doug. fun. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that, that concludes this uh, issue of Get to Know here on the Outliers YouTube channel. We thank Linwood for being with us. It's always a pleasure. So until next time, and then we will see you all then. Hang in there and keep writing. <laughs>